Okay. So I just accepted. Can you see my screen? Yes, yet? I can. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really my pleasure um, to be speaking with you this afternoon on the topic of genetic testing for inherited cardiomyopathies. It's something I've spent the better portion of my career so far being involved with. So I hope that you find this information helpful. And as um, Gina mentioned, please do um, put forward any and all questions that you have so that we can uh, review this information information at the end. If you're wondering about it, it's quite possible that somebody else in the audience is as well. So with that, we'll jump right into it. I wanted to start our discussion today by reviewing terms that we will be using to discuss genetic testing this afternoon. The hope is that this will provide a foundation to allow for an overall better understanding of today's webinar content. The image on the right here illustrates the way that our genetic information is organized or packaged in our cells. Inside the cells of our body is our entire collection of DNA or genetic information. This is also called our genome. Our DNA is arranged into double-stranded helical structures that may or may not be familiar to some people in the audience. If we were to unravel this double helix and take a closer look, we'd see that our DNA is made up of a string of individual letters called nucleotides. And this long string of letters is then broken up into smaller chunks that we call genes. Most genes in our body provide instructions to make proteins, and then it's the proteins that go on to perform a job in our body. We have two copies of each of our genes, one that we get from our mother and one that we get from our father. When there's a change in the typical letter or nucleotide order of the DNA, we call this a mutation or a variant. These term terms are often used interchangeably. In some cases, variants can cause diseases like cardiomyopathy, while in other cases, variants are simply an example of normal human variation in the DNA and don't necessarily lead to developing medical problems. When a variant does lead to disease, it's possible that this variant can then be passed from one generation to the next since we share a portion of our DNA with our relatives. So again, uh, we have two copies of our genes, one from our mother, one from our father. The most common way that inherited uh, cardiomyopathies are passed from one generation to the next is through an autosomal, what we call an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And this means that um, Despite the fact that we have two copies of the gene, one copy of the gene has a change or a mutation to it that is making it not work properly. Even though the other copy of the gene does not have a mutation, this person is still at risk to develop a cardiomyopathy. Then when that person goes on to have children, they'll either pass on the copy of the gene with the mutation or pass on the copy of the mutation, uh, the copy of the gene without the mutation, giving a 50% chance to pass the mutation on to each child. Other features of autosomal dominant mutations are that they do not skip generations. Sometimes when we look at a family history, it might appear that the condition itself is skipping generations, but this has some other possible explanations like variability in how the condition presents from one person to the next, but the underlying mutation itself will not skip generations. And autosomal dominant conditions um, also affect both males and females. There are other genetic inheritance patterns that we see in, in, we see in genetics, but I've highlighted this autosomal dominant pattern again here because it is by far the most common one that we see with inherited cardiomyopathies. There are a variety of reasons why somebody can develop a cardiomyopathy. It could be as a result of other medical problems or perhaps toxic exposures to substances like alcohol or drugs or chemotherapeutic agents, um, to just to name a few. But there are definitely some things that make us suspicious that a person has a genetic cause for their cardiomyopathy. First is that we get suspicious when we see a far earlier age of diagnosis than we would typically expect to see for a particular condition. Another example of a red flag might be a person who has a far more severe presentation or um, an unusual or atypical presentation of disease. 
However, um, undoubtedly the biggest red flag is the presence of a family history. This can include both a family history of the same condition, for an example, um, a person with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who also has a parent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But family history can also be a red flag when there are just other cardiovascular problems that we suspect could be related to a person's cardiomyopathy. This might include, for example, a relative who needed a pacemaker at a young age, even if we're not quite sure why that pacemaker was necessary. An important reminder here is that cardiomyopathies can still be genetic even when none of these features are present and when there is no family history of the condition. So in an effort to keep this webinar broadly relevant to everyone listening, I will try to focus more broadly on inherited cardiomyopathies as a group um, using examples from specific conditions. So here what I've outlined is that there are many features that are shared in common by inherited cardiomyopathies. Again, as we discussed, most often these are autosomal dominant. We know that these conditions can present at very different ages, even in the same family. And similarly, as I've mentioned already, they can um, we can see quite variable disease presentations in the same family, with some people being more severely affected and others being quite um, mildly affected. And for all the inherited cardiomyopathies, we know that they can be caused by many different genes. In, in fact, in some cases, the same genes can cause uh, more than one cardiomyopathy. Over the past decade, there's really been a, an amazing amount of advances in technology that allow us now to do genetic testing faster and cheaper than ever before. And to think that just back in the 90s and early 2000s, it took over a decade to complete the Human Genome Project. We now know that if we you know, fast forward to 2016, that this same type of whole genome sequencing can be accomplished in less than a week. And since cardiomyopathy genetic testing has been available now for over a decade for some conditions, we've seen how these advances in technology have led to improvements in the, gene in the genetic testing that we can offer to our patients. There are two main overarching categories of genetic testing that it would be worth defining up front. The first is diagnostic testing. This is a test that's used in a patient with a known or suspected inherited cardiovascular disease or inherited cardiomyopathy, and it's used to identify the underlying genetic etiology or genetic cause of their diagnosis. If we are able to do this, if we get a positive result from a diagnostic genetic test, then it makes it possible to do the second type of testing, which is called predictive genetic testing. And this type of te testing is used in a healthy relative to determine whether or not that individual inherited the family's DNA change and is therefore at risk for disease development. There are many different ways that we can test for genetic diseases. We'll now spend some time talking about the types of tests that are most often used or considered for inherited cardiomyopathies. The first example here is a known mutation test or a familial variant test. There are many different names that are used for this testing, but it's referring to the targeted type of testing that we just discussed that we use for predictive testing when we know the mutation in the family and we're just looking to see if other relatives also have the same mutation. The type of test that's currently most often used for inherited cardiomyopathies is called the multi-gene panel test. And these tests are considered for conditions that um, can be caused by many different genes. And the panels are comprised of genes that are both clearly known or have you know, enough evidence that they're suspected to cause a particular condition. And there are many examples of inherited conditions where this is the concurrently preferred test model that includes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, LVNC, um, as well as other inherited cardiovascular conditions.
We now also have even broader multi-panel, multi-gene panel tests that include a larger list of genes known to cause a variety of different cardiomyopathies. So these might be called like a comprehensive cardiomyopathy panel, for example. Um, and, and these panels include genes that you know cause, cause different types of cardiomyopathy and they're tested all at once. So one might consider using these tests if a prior a more disease-focused panel was negative, or um, if they might use it as an initial test for a person when either the person, him or herself, or the family has features of more than one cardiomyopathy. We now have even broader tests in broader sequencing platforms that we can use that look at either your whole genome or your whole exome. And these tests are, can be used in situations, again, where some of the initial panel testing failed to identify a genetic cause, but there's really still a high suspicion that there is a genetic uh, disease in the family. One might move on to, to, look, to use these types of tests. These are more recently becoming utilized in clinical practice. And while you're still most often used when multi-gene panel tests have been negative, or, you know, and there's still a strong suggestion of genetic diseases, in some cases, people are moving to use these as a more first-line test. Despite the fact that these tests cover a far greater number of genes and panel tests, early experience is suggesting that the detection rates really are still quite similar to panel tests. However, this is definitely an evolving area that we'll continue to learn more about as people start to use these types of technologies more and more. These technologies do have an advantage over panel testing in that there is a vast amount of data that's collected when we do these types of tests, and this information can be reanalyzed over time as new information becomes available. So for example, we may not understand now that a particular gene is, is related to a condition, but that information might emerge over time. And with these broader tests, we would have the, the data is already there, we'd have the ability to go back and look. However, there are some important considerations with whole um, exome or genome sequencing. Because these tests are broad, they may reveal information that is entirely unrelated to the reason that a person is being tested. For example, you might be looking for an answer about why you developed a cardiomyopathy, but learn that you're at risk for developing an entirely different medical problem. And while this information might be helpful to know for someone's medical care, it may be more than um, people are interested in getting at that moment in time. And also these tests right now are still more expensive and may be less well covered by insurance companies that would prefer that you have a less expensive version of a genetic test. So if we return back to thinking about the multi-gene panel tests, you can see from this slide here that there are um, a number of different genes that are included on these panel tests. Like for some conditions, there are you know, over 30, whereas you know, maybe in something like LVNC, there are fewer genes included on the panel tests. How uh, panels are made up do differ from labs. There are now many different labs that offer these types of tests. And so that's one of the things that we pay attention to when we're ordering a test is what exactly are the genes on a panel? And are these genes related to anything else other than cardiomyopathy? That way we as providers can prepare people for the types of information that they might hear back. The other thing that this slide, slide points out is that um, when we look at the detection rates for these tests, we are you know, far from perfect about finding the genetic causes of diseases that we really do suspect to be genetic. So it really is possible that individuals, um, even with a high suspicion of genetic disease, can go through genetic testing and get a negative result. So just to think about what you might expect from a genetic testing process, if we think about before you do testing. The process starts by meeting with a provider. This is ideally someone who has experience with genetic testing. And the reason is that genetic testing is not as straightforward as other laboratory testing. So there really is a benefit in speaking with somebody who has experience and can provide you with some detailed pre-test genetic counseling. That process often includes if this has not already happened, it would include a detailed review of family history. And this helps us to select the right person to start the genetic testing in in the family. We um, prefer to start testing by using the most severely affected person in a family. This gives us the best chance of finding the cause of disease in the family. 
Also, in some cases, there may be more than one gene mutation in a family that's leading to disease. So again, here, if we start with the most affected person, it will better help us to find all responsible DNA changes in the family that are leading to the cardiomyopathy. The pretest counseling will also review all the particulars about the test that's being recommended in your case. What's on the panel, what other um, considerations, you know, what other genetic information might come back from the panel. And there's a detailed discussion about the benefits and limitations of genetic testing, both as we know them more broadly, but also perhaps in your specific situation, since everyone's diagnosis, diagnostic situation might be a little different as well as their family structure. So when we think more broadly about the advantages of genetic testing, the first is that it really can help us to confirm um, a diagnosis. And sometimes that can really be helpful if there was some ambiguity about a diagnosis. And it can help us to answer the questions about why a diagnosis happened in a person. And this information can be helpful because it may allow us to rule out potential other causes of disease or other diagnoses that were being considered. And when that's the case, it sometimes helps us to better define the right management um, plan for a person. Probably the most powerful use of genetic testing is its ability to definitively identify who else in a family is at risk for disease development. So again, thinking back to this predictive genetic testing that we talked about, if we know the cause of disease in the family, it becomes more straightforward to test other family members regardless of whether or not they have cardiomyopathy. Those who have a mutation present are at risk for disease development, and that tells us that they need to be um, in the pipeline to get periodic cardiovascular evaluation as defined by whatever the condition is in the family. We also know that that person would have a 50% chance to pass this mutation on to um, each of his or her children. And then we can have discussions if people are still at a point in life when they are expanding their family, there may be options that we can discuss with them um, so that they can make reproductive planning decisions. When a person in a family does not have the, D, the responsible DNA change, then we can reassure them that they are not at risk for disease development, they cannot pass this mutation on to their children, and no further clinical follow-up is recommended or needed in those cases, except in the event that somebody develops some symptoms that would be worth evaluating. And then on a larger scale, this can really, genetic testing and what we learn back from these results can really help us to better understand the underlying mechanisms of disease. It gives us in, insight into why these diseases happen, how they develop, and how they vary from one person to the next. And what we hope is that by better understanding these things, that we'll be able to develop novel treatment strategies. However, there really are some limitations with genetic testing that are important for people to consider when they're thinking about genetic testing. The first is that it does not always provide a definitive results or you know, a clear answer that we're looking for. We have a, an incomplete understanding of how DNA can lead to disease, and so sometimes we don't get a clear yes or no answer with a genetic test. We, even when we have a result from a genetic test, we're often not able to use that result to make any predictions or treatment decisions based on a particular result. So we're not able to give anybody a prognosis, for example, based on a genetic test result. There is a potential for discrimination with some types of insurance, and we'll discuss that in um, the next slide. While some people, um, there are some people who will experience some negative emotional reactions to genetic testing, including things like fear or anger, sadness or guilt. These findings can emerge in people with positive or negative results. And lastly, the the testing process as a whole or results specifically can worsen existing tensions in a family or in some cases create new ones as individuals make different decisions about whether or not to pursue testing or get different results back from their testing. So we'll talk through some of the basic test logistics that sometimes people have questions about. So first, where are we gonna get the sample? How are we gonna get the DNA? Blood is the most often used sample type for genetic testing. It gives us the best quantity of DNA, but as technology has changed over time, there are now 
a more different more types of samples that can be used to collect DNA and one of examples that is saliva or other cheek swab types of collection kits that are a perfectly acceptable sample type for testing in some cases we can also use pathology specimens for testing to see if we're able to get um, a, a, a usable DNA sample because there's more variability with the types of samples we can also now sometimes do sample collection remotely meaning that people don't have to make a trip into the hospital. Um, some laboratories allow for the arrangement of home blood draws or can send their kits directly to a patient's house in order to collect, um, say, a saliva sample at home. Cost is often a question that people have, and the costs do vary. Laboratories have different policies about billing and payments, but overall, cost is something that we have seen improve in recent years. So I do encourage people that if cost has been prohibitive in the past or something that you've kind of heard things about and was um, discouraging to you, that it may be worth reconsidering um, and talking to your providers about to see if there's any new information or options that might make genetic testing more available to you. Many labs now offer assistance with billing that can limit out-of-pocket costs and um, just give more, um, they do more work on the front end to let you know up front what your out-of-pocket costs might be, which is very helpful for families trying to decide whether or not this is an affordable option for them. Turnaround times um, have also increased. These tests used to take months in the past and now are often um, completed in four to six weeks and even as fast as a couple of weeks in some cases. And as I alluded to before, there are some important insurance implications that we think about specifically for unaffected individuals who are doing that predictive testing. So sometimes people have questions about whether or not a genetic test result can be used against them um, in a negative way by an insurance company. So we do have the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, abbreviated GINA. What this does is provides federal legal protection from genetic discrimination in the areas of health insurance and employment. So it says that predictive genetic, genetic information, whether it's family history or a predictive genetic test result, can't be used by a health insurance company for the purposes of underwriting, so deciding about premiums or coverage. It also stipulates that an employer can't require a genetic test or use a genetic test as part of the hiring, firing, or promoting process in their company. Company. Genetic, there are some limitations to GINA in that it, it does not provide protections in the area of life insurance, disability, or long-term care insurance, and this is not relevant for people who already have a diagnosis. So if you have decided to proceed with genetic testing, what should you expect to happen after? So once the results are available, there will be a plan in place to review your results with the ordering provider or somebody else in the office. This might be in person or it might be done, accomplished using telemedicine strategy, like either a phone call or a video conference. And first and foremost, there'll be a discussion about what, if anything, was found. And if there is something found, um, an important part of the conversation is how confident your provider is that whatever was found is really the cause of your disease. Because as I mentioned, it's sometimes not a clear yes or no answer. We often think of results from genetic testing as being probabilistic, and what we mean by this is that when you get a genetic test result, we're really looking at what is the likelihood that this particular variant causes the disease in this person or that it could cause disease in an unaffected person. An important part of your conversation with your provider should be coming away with under, the understanding of like what are these what are the implications of these test results for you, and what are the implications for your family, and what if any next steps are available for you and your family. And you know, one question that's you know important to ask and come away with is is my genetic test result something that could be used for predictive testing in my relatives. Sharing information with your family is an important part of genetic testing. We do really think of genetic testing as a family test since it often doesn't involve only one person. Your genetic test results may have an impact for your other family members. Your providers can often be a resource about ways to discuss this information with your family. Sometimes they can help in writing letters that effectively communicate information to family members. This, this information is often complex, so it's completely fair to ask for some assistance with making sure the right message is being communicated with your family. Sometimes there are other written or electronic resources that can be used to share this information as well. 
your genetic test report itself contains all the information a family member would need to use in order to order genetic testing. So that's something that a provider will often provide to you so that you have it um, for your own records and can share um, as needed throughout your family. So what is included on a genetic test report? These are very lengthy documents, and the format of them will differ by lab, but overall the contents of the report remain the same. The information that they're describing is what test was ordered, what, what genes were included, and what, if any, findings came back from the test. So as you can see here, it's describing what the exact DNA change that was found was and what the laboratory thinks about this DNA change. The report also includes all the information that the laboratory used to come to their assessment. So just to look back, if we think about what is this actual spelling change that they're describing in the DNA, this diagram here depicts what they're talking about. So you can see here, this is what we might expect in an unaffected family member, this sequence of the DNA. And here we see a C switched out for the C. So this is a very classic type of DNA mutation we see that we call a substitution. And even just that very very subtle change in the DNA can be enough to cause the gene not to work properly and to set off a chain of events that leads somebody to develop a cardiomyopathy later in life. So as I've mentioned, a laboratory is gathering and using a wide amount of information to decide whether or not anything they find is truly the cause of disease in a person. So all of this the information about the, a DNA variant is used to assign a classification using a five-tier system that you see depicted here. And this classification tells us as the provider how confident the lab is that they have found the cause of a person's disease. So this ranges from something like benign or likely benign, which means that there was no clear disease-causing change identified identified, these may often not even be included on a report, and these would be considered a negative result. On the other hand, we have findings that are called either likely pathogenic or pathogenic, and these are types of findings where there is strong enough evidence for to suggest that this particular DNA variant can cause disease, that it would say that the, the lab, allow the laboratory to consider this a positive result, meaning they feel as though they felt the cause of disease, and this is something that could be considered to be used for predictive testing a family. And then, of course, we have the more kind of dreaded middle zone with um, where we may, the laboratory may find a result, but they're not sure about the significance of the results. These are considered ambiguous results. Sometimes we can do strategic testing of other affected people in the family to get additional information about whether or not this appears to be causing disease. But until we feel more confident about what role, if any, this is playing in the development of cardiomyopathy, we generally do not recommend recommend using these types of findings for predictive testing in other members of the family. So why is this whole process so hard? As time has marched on, we have realized that there is the, our DNA and the human genome is really far more complex than we originally gave it credit for. We each have about 3 billion base pairs of DNA, and that's about 20,000 different genes. And each individual, all of us have many different DNA variants, and not all of these variants will ultimately go on to cause disease. So sometimes it's really hard to figure out if any given DNA variant is actually clini clinically significant and whether or not it could change the gene's function in a way that it would um, lead to somebody developing a disease later in life. So to summarize again, we, when we think about genetic testing, we think of three main categories of results that we can get back. A positive result, again, means that there's enough evidence to say that this could cause disease in an affected person, and this can typically be used for predictive testing in unaffected family members. A negative result means that no clearly disease-causing change in the DNA was identified. Unfortunately, this does not rule out um, rule out the fact that a person's condition could be genetic. It just means that based on what we know right now and what we can test for, we could not find an answer with genetic testing. So we do still consider there, there is a possibility, possibility for genetic disease in these families and that family members may be at risk. However, predictive genetic testing would not be available when we were not able to find the cause in the affected relative in the family.
And then lastly, we have that category of unknown or uncertain significance. And this is where a DNA variant was identified, but we're really unsure about whether or not this is in fact the cause of disease. Sometimes we can do more testing in a family to try to sort this out, but we would not recommend predictive testing until we have more certainty about the role that this is playing. So let's just take a look at a case example to get a feeling for how genetic testing can play out and be potentially useful in a family. So here we have a 32-year-old man who was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He had no clear other family history of HCM, but there are certainly some other suspicious diagnoses in his family, um, including his brother with the mention of athlete's heart, as well as his, as his father and paternal uncle who had sudden or unexplained deaths that um, might need a little bit more investigation. So he opted to go through genetic testing to try to figure out why he developed HCM, um, in large part for the benefit of potentially having this information for his young children. So he was found to have a, a positive result, a pathogenic mutation in one of the genes commonly associated with HCM. And this allowed other family members to then go on and be tested. So this allowed us to clarify some of these ambiguous diagnoses. It allows us to now diagnose his brother with HCM. And it, it tells us that these sudden unexplained deaths may in fact have been um, sudden cardiac deaths related to HCM. So his brother can now get clinical care for his diagnosis and we might consider a defibrillator based on these worrisome sudden deaths in the family. And we've also been able to, to pare down the number of people in the family who are considered to be at risk. So rather than all the close relatives of a person with a diagnosis, we can now focus in on those relatives who are have positive genetic test results and focus our long-term genetic testing um, follow-up effort, I mean, um, sorry, clinical evaluation follow-up efforts on those individuals. People who are negative can be reassured that they're not at risk for disease development and they're not at risk to pass this on to their children. And again, you know, longitudinal follow would not be necessary unless there is some important symptom development that needs to be checked out. And we can focus these um, follow-up efforts on the genotype positive or genetic testing positive individuals who are at risk for disease development. We can also then sometimes have discussions, as I mentioned earlier, about reproductive genetic testing options in families. One example of this is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, often abbreviated as PGD. When there is a, a, a clearly disease-causing mutation identified in a family, if people are um, willing and able to undergo in vitro fertilization, it's possible to do um, to create embryos external to the body through IVF and then do genetic testing at a very early stage to determine if the family's mutation is present. Those who have those embryos that are positive would not be used for implantation. Embryos that are negative could be um, transferred into um, to initiate a pregnancy. And then oftentimes for their um, invasive genetic uh, invasive testing is recommended in pregnancy to confirm the PGD results. So these are options that are certainly not for everybody, but do become available for discussion when we know the cause of disease in a family. So we've talked a little bit about the potential um, need in some circumstances of testing other members of the family to better understand disease. So we'll look at a um, better understand a genetic test result, excuse me. So we'll look at another family example here. And we have a, a young man who was diagnosed with HCM. He decides to undergo genetic testing and has a different, this different type of a result come back, this finding of uncertain significance. So in this situation, one of the recommendations we can see on the report is that testing other family members might help to understand the significance of this variant. And here, we're fortunate to have other, uh, many other affected individuals in the family. So if we test some of these individuals, we might be able to see that all the individuals who have the diagnosis of cardiomyopathy also have the DNA change. And this provides supportive evidence that the variant is truly the cause of disease in the family, which can be quite quite helpful and might give us the confidence to, to then use this to test unaffected members of the family. On the other hand, if you have individuals in the family with a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy who do not have the DNA variant, this starts to um, call into question whether or not this DNA variant is the truly the cause of disease in the family. <clears throat> 
Of course, not all families, um, in not all families will this type of segregation analysis be possible. There may not be other affected individuals, the affected individuals may be deceased or otherwise unavailable or unwilling to proceed with testing. And this also um, brings up the point that sometimes right from the start, we're in a, it can be in a challenging situation um, with genetic testing. If we have the only person in a family, is, is when that person is no longer living, it can make it difficult to initiate genetic testing in the family, though not impossible, because as I mentioned, we now have a broader type of samples um, that we can potentially use for genetic testing, which in some cases makes post-mortem genetic testing a possibility. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking um, to people in the audience who may have already had genetic testing, um, because there are some important points that we like to think about for folks who have already had genetic testing. And these two concepts are reassessing variants and retesting when prior genetic testing was negative. So when we think about reassessing prior genetic test results, the reason for this is that our knowledge about human DNA variation changes over time. And this change in knowledge can lead to a new understanding about prior test results. So it is important to check back in with your provider, either the one who initially ordered the genetic testing or whoever you're seeing now, to see if there have been any important changes in the classification that might change the recommendations that this provider made to you and your family. Another point here is that um, testing, sometimes people have had testing that was done as part of a research protocol. Um, and the processes that research laboratories use do differ from what um, commercial clinical genetic testing laboratories used. So it is often recommended that if your prior genetic testing was done in a research laboratory, that it may be worthwhile considering perform, um, confirming that result in a clinical genetic testing laboratory. Another question that often comes up is, what if my prior genetic testing was negative? Um, should I think about repeating genetic testing now? I, you know, people are sometimes are aware that panel size have really panel sizes have really dramatically increased over the past decade or so. Interestingly, um, research has begun to show us that when it comes to panel size, bigger really is not always better. Uh, more genes does not necessarily um, lead us to better detection rates. So if you look at this diagram here, um, it shows us if you follow along on this square line here, um, you can see that this is the, um, the percentage of people over the past decade who had a positive genetic test result from genetic testing. And this is um, an example from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what we see here is this is using very different versions of the panel, um, ranging from just a few genes all the way up to the genes that were um, panels that were offering 18 plus genes just a few years ago. And what we see is that there really is not, there certainly is not an increase in detection rate. And in fact, we do see a slight decrease in detection rate that is not likely due to the test itself, but perhaps due to um, the types of people who are being referred to the laboratory for testing and the um, slightly more stringent rules that we apply to consider somebody having a positive test result now. This isn't the case for all conditions, though, because we know in the case of dilated cardiomyopathy, all it took was the addition of one new gene be associate, being associated with DCM, the Titan gene, to really increase the, the detection rates of tests for DCM. So this is an example where if you were a person who had genetic testing for dilated cardiomyopathy back in you know, the earlier um, 2000s, it might be worth um, checking in with your provider about what was included on that panel. And this is across the board. If you have questions about whether additional genetic testing might be appropriate in your case, you should talk to your provider about what testing was done um, and have a discussion about what the current genetic testing panels offer and whether or not there really is um, a significant increase in the detection rate that's available now that might make it worthwhile considering repeating testing in your case. <laughs> 
So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to go through what I would consider some frequently asked questions. Some of these were review concepts that we've already discussed. Some of them uh, might touch upon some new questions that weren't fully addressed yet. Um, so the first is if somebody just asks, what does it mean if I have a mutation? Will I definitely get disease? And this is an important concept because if a person already has the diagnosis, they already have the disease, it confirms the diagnosis. But for a person that's doing that predictive genetic testing, it does tell us that a person um, might develop disease, but it doesn't tell us that they will for sure. There's no way we can use genetic testing for that purpose. And I apologize, I'm looking at that slide, that's a slightly outdated statistic. We're not really sure how likely it is that a person who has a DNA change will go on to develop disease, but we know it's not 100%. Another question people some might ask is, are there some mutations or DNA variation that are worse than others? Um, and we know that cardiomyopathies are very diverse diseases and they can have very variable presentations, sometimes even within the same family. And so it's, it is uncommon for unrelated families to, to share the same DNA changes. So we're often limited with how much information we know about any particular DNA change. And we do know that even in the same family, the same DNA change changes can lead to different courses. So we really don't have an abundant amount of information about any one DNA change that would allow us to make these types of predictions to tell somebody if their result is indicating that their outcome would be more mild or severe. And we have touched on this, but a common question is, I have a mutation, will my kids get it? And we know that most often the answer to that is that there is a 50% chance that it could be passed on if a person has it. Another question uh, that often comes up is, I've had genetic testing, but it was negative. What is, what was, what does this mean? Can my disease still be genetic? And so we know that we don't fully understand all the ways that our DNA can cause disease. So it is important to remember that a negative genetic test result does not eliminate the chance that there is a genetic cause for disease. And family members may still be at risk to develop the disease and should continue with this recommended uh, periodic evaluation. And lastly, if we just want to think about why should I have genetic testing performed? You can kind of group them into two categories. One, as we've you know talked about already, is that there are potential benefits to you and your family to better understand why your disease happened, who else in your family is at risk. But we also do think that there are larger benefits to science as we continue to learn how these different DNA changes lead to disease and potentially can lead us to better understand the right ways to treat these conditions. So just to summarize, um, what can genetic testing do for us now, or what do we think about this as a process right now? It's not a simple blood test, but it can be a useful blood test in families. It's considered one component of someone's overall cardiovascular genetic evaluation. Um, it can give us some probabilistic information about how likely somebody is to develop a disease, but we have to bear in mind that the interpretation of this, these results can be complicated and are um, best done in the hands of people that have some familiarity with genetic testing. We often think of these as family-based tests because again, there's implications for family members. Sometimes we need to rely on other family members, particularly affected family members, to help us to better understand disease. And also other family members thinking about, you know, if we think about unaffected family members are ones who can truly benefit from this type of testing in a family. And that's this point here that it can really allow us to precisely define the risk in certain families and um, dismiss some relatives from ongoing follow-up. This can reduce overall costs for an individual and the kind of psychological burden that can come along with um, feeling like you might be at risk for a disease. But when we think about doing testing now, we just need to understand what the benefits and limitations are of these tests. We need to go into them with realistic expectations about how likely we are to get a usable result and you know, how that uh, result can be used for a person with disease and a person without disease. And this makes it really necessary that you have thorough pre and post test counseling with your um, genetic testing as part of your genetic testing process.
So just to wrap up, you know, if we think about genetics and for inherited heart disease in the future, we think of this um, as integrating genetics into medicine as giving us really tremendous opportunities to advance both how we care for patients and also just how we fundamentally understand disease. And we might be able to foster new understandings about disease biology that can then allow us to come up with really targeted um, treatment strategies that would, you know, be effective to changing the overall natural history of these diseases. So while there may be some challenges to genetic testing now, it's important to look beyond and see how we might be able to um, use this information down the line as well. So in closing, I just wanted to leave just quickly two resources. The first is just an overall kind of primer or overview of some of the genetic concepts and, um, and genetic testing concepts that we've talked about today. There are some helpful diagrams and illustrations that people might find helpful for themselves or to share with their family members. And the second bullet here is um, a, a patient-centered um, website uh, put forward by the National Society of Genetic Counselors that similarly has helpful information about genetics and genetic testing, as well as a tool to help you identify a genetic counselor in your area who might be able to help you with this process if you're not already plugged in with somebody who can. So with that, I am going to end the formal presentation uh, part of the webinar and open it up to questions. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Allison. That was so, um, so informative and wonderful information. So we really thank you again for your time. Um, we do have a few questions. And if anyone else wants to submit a question, um, please feel welcome to type it into the question box and we will go through as many as we have the opportunity to to get to. Um, so the first question is, do you recommend genetic testing for a woman with peripartum cardiomyopathy and no family history? That's really a great question. Um, and I think this is something that it is absolutely worth having a discussion with somebody who it has a kind of current understanding about genetic testing. We do know that it, you know, it, it does appear in, in some families that there may be a predisposition to pericardium cardio, uh, cardiomyopathy, and that sometimes this can go along with other people having cardiomyopathy developing at other points in life. And this brings up a really important point about family history is that we can sometimes be limited by what we know about our family history and um, we sometimes learn very valuable information by just having people undergo um, evaluations based on you know the recommendation of being a relative of a person with a potentially inherited cardiomyopathy. Those types of evaluations can really give both valuable information to the person him or herself who might find out that they're at, that they have a disease that they didn't know about because it wasn't causing them any symptoms but it also can help the family as a whole or help us to understand that this really might in fact be a genetic disease for a particular family. So I really do, um, you know, while sometimes, you know, the having no family history might seem as, a, you know, a discouraging about whether or not this could be genetic, it does not um, preclude somebody from doing genetic testing. So I still think it very much is, is something that's worth considering and talking to um, a genetics professional about. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question is, my mother was diagnosed with HCM. Does she need to be genetically tested first to determine the mutation before I am tested to see if I have it? Absolutely. So that is a really great question. And that is certainly our preferred strategy. When there is a person in a family who is affected, we always start testing in that person when we can. That gives us the best chance. You know, by taking the person with disease, it gives us a kind of head start to know that if we find a DNA change in that person, um, that it might be related to their diagnosis. So it gives us a better chance of understanding any genetic test results that we come back with, um, where it can be more challenging if we start genetic testing in a person without disease to know if we come across a DNA change, but the person doesn't have, you know, say HCM in your example, 
it's harder to really know whether or not that particular DNA change can really cause HCM. So the way that you've outlined it is exactly the way we prefer to do it. Start by testing your mother, see if we can find a result in your mother's testing, and then do a much, then take her result and do a focused test in you to see whether or not you share that same DNA variant. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Um, another question is, is there any indication that if the ACA goes away, that the protections provided by GINA will also go away? So this, this is a great question. I think that we do find ourselves, um, you know, in kind of concerning our tumultuous times about um, the future landscape of um, health insurance and the protections that it has provided. I think, you know, um, some of the kind of more recent developments as of, you know, last week do tell us that we're not quite sure, um, you know, what if anything a new healthcare plan or model would look like. It is something that people are paying particularly close attention to. Um, the hope is that the protections provided by GINA as a kind of standalone law would remain intact, but I think, you know, it is something that those of us in the genetics community are very much kind of thinking about and keeping our eyes on as we um, see what evolves in the coming years about, um, you know, what if any new healthcare plans become enacted. So I think it's hard to have a straight, a clear answer about that right now, but it is something that um, it's smart to be thinking about, and I think we'll all be keeping our eyes on. Okay, thank you so much for that comment. Um, so that was all of the questions, and um, and we're just about at an hour. Um, so I just wanted to to thank you again, Allison. Um, and before we close, can you see my screen again? I just wanted to point something out. Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to to just share this resource um, in case um, anyone is interested in it um, as as a supplement to the great talk that we heard today. But CCF also offers um, a, a, a video about genetic testing. Um, and so if you go to our website, which is childrenscardiomyopathy.org, and then click on support services on the left and go into um, educational materials, which is the page that I'm on, um, you can access this video, which is called Know Your Heart, Genetic Testing for Cardiomyopathy Families, and um, it's, it's, it will open up a YouTube uh, video. And so um, that's just another, um, another resource that can be helpful to families to, to give them another, um, a, another um, resource for this topic. And Allison is also, um, was also a, a helper with our project, uh, with that project. So thank you again for your help with that project, Allison. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, and thanks for pointing that out because obviously I felt uh, as if people made their way to the webinar that I would hope that they are um, aware of all the fantastic resources that you guys have as part of your website. So oh, certainly no, absolutely don't, don't no. overlook that because there really is a, uh, an amazing wealth of knowledge there. Oh, well, thank you. And um, we always, we always, you know, are grateful for your contributions and sharing your expertise with us. So we really appreciate it. And thanks again for, for spending, spending time with us this afternoon. Um, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And for everyone else, um, we will be posting this webinar on our online community, CCF Connect. So you can always reference it um, in the future again. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Take care.